welcome to another session of X Camera. So X Camera is a series of talks taking place here in Kitchener Waterloo and in the Waterloo region. We are in the lands of the Anishinaabe, Neutral, and Haudenosaunee people on the Haldeman Tract that was granted to the Six Nations in 1784. When I do this land acknowledgement, I like to remember the treaty with one spoon, which was a treaty among the First Nations before the arrival of the Europeans to North America. And what this treaty spelled out was not only the duties of each nation towards each other, but the duties of people towards each other and of people towards the land. What the treaty says is that we only take what we need, that we leave enough for others, and we keep the dish clean. I'm very pleased to welcome here today an artist who will talk about the land and our impact on it. My guest today, our guest today and speaker today is Lou Shepard. And she will talk about, and they will talk about their work, recent work, creating graphic scores as a means of witnessing, reflecting and responding to our rapidly changing environment. Lou Shepard is an interdisciplinary artist from Chipuktuk, also known as Halifax. They have exhibited in Canada and internationally, notably in the Toronto Biennial, in the Antarctic Biennial, and the Antarctic Pavilion in Venice. Lou re uh, received an Emerging Atlantic Artist Award in 2017 and has been twice long lesson for the Sobe Award in 2018 and 2020, receiving an International Residency Award in 2018. In their current practice, Lou uses processes of translation and metaphor to interrogate the structures of power and performativity in data and language. Their work often creates them, leads them to collaborate with communities and with musicians, visual artists, and performing artists. They are currently the Branscombe House Artist in Residence with the city. Actually, this is not accurate anymore. <laughs> uh, um, well, uh, in Halifax. Welcome, Lou. I'm so very pleased to have you here. I wanted to have you here on the panel, on a, on an X Camera talk. Since I saw your talk at uh, the Canadian New Music Network, mm. where we both talked about interdisciplinarity. Welcome, mm -hmm. and I look forward to your talk. Now, just for those who are uh, joining us for the first time, I just want to outline the, the format of this uh, of these talks. Uh, Lou will talk for about uh, 40, 45 minutes. I will come back and ask her questions, uh, which I hope will come up from the audience. When you are asking questions, please do me the great favor of asking them in the Q&A. So I won't have to go through all the chats to find the questions. So please type your questions at Q&A and I shall give them then to uh, Lou. At one o'clock, which is the official part ends. So anybody has to go, can go then. But anybody wants to linger and uh, meet everybody in this virtual room, please stay on. We'll promote you all to co-hosts, and our conversation can continue for about half an hour. It's the equivalent of us kind of lingering after the live talks, uh, the fresh ground, where we used to sit down and have lunch with the speaker, and where some of the most inter interesting uh, conversations used to happen. So again, welcome, Lou, and please tell us about your work. Thank you. Um, so it's very nice to get to come to, well, to be virtually uh, with you all and with InterArts Matrix. It's been a long time coming. Uh, the, the pandemic interrupted my being able to come in person, uh, but I do hope to get to travel to, uh, to do some work in person in the future. Um, 
But in the meantime, really grateful to be able to do this online and really grateful that you're all here uh, listening online. I know we're in a time of heavy, heavy screen use. So, so uh, yeah, I feel, feel very lucky to get to share my screen with you. I, I, uh, I'm talking to you from Nova Scotia, actually. I am technically still the Branscombe House Artist in Residence in Richmond, BC. I'm still finishing some projects with them. Uh, and it was a really wonderful residency that I did there. Uh, but because at a certain point we were doing everything virtually with that community and I was feeling more and more isolated from my own community being uh, away from home, uh, I ended up moving back to Nova Scotia. So I just got here a couple of weeks ago and now I'm talking to you and behind my screen, I can see the beautiful Atlantic Ocean and I feel very lucky to be here. Um, Nova Scotia, of course, is also known as Mi'kma'ki. So uh, as my own acknowledgement of the space that I'm in, I, I'm in the unceded and ancestral lands of the Mi'kmaq people. And just as a note to encourage you to think uh, something that's really on my mind and on a lot of Nova Scotians' minds right now that you might have heard about um, is the dispute that's happening between the Indigenous fishery and the settler fishery here in Nova Scotia uh, and the assertion of Indigenous rights to fish for a moderate livelihood. Uh, so if you're not aware of that situation or you haven't, uh, haven't had time to really look into it, just um, please check it out because uh, it's something that's happening right now in Canada and in an action of colonial violence that that we need to attend to. So just a little, a little, uh, I guess, poke for that. Um, as well, of course, because we're joining each other all in virtual space, I always like to say uh, by way of a kind of acknowledgement of, uh, of our physical territory, but then also uh, thinking about how we might acknowledge our, our presence in virtual space and that our virtual spaces do carry a lot of the same uh, legacies of colonialism and legacies of, of problematics that the physical spaces do. So as a little thought to put out there in our virtual spaces, thinking about how can we uh, support indigenous sovereignty on the internet and how can we support um, support the continuation of indigeneity and indigenous arts practices and, uh, and indigenous culture uh, online, as well as in our physical territories. So uh, I'll, put it, I'll put it out there. I don't know exactly how to do that, but it's something that I'm thinking a lot about sort of within the context of this wild time that we find ourselves in. Um, I'm gonna share my screen with you. All right. So, like I said, uh, I'm from I'm from Nova Scotia. I grew up in Nova Scotia, uh, and I grew up really connected to the land around me. I grew up on the Bay of Fundy, highest tides in the world, um, and so the the presence of nature was very much a part of my my experience uh, of place. And uh, and you know, I learned that you had to be really careful about walking on the water because you could easily get swept out to sea if you were caught in the tides in the wrong place. And But also just aware and sort of surrounded by rich natural beauty uh, that I felt really like uh, was mine and was something that I was entitled to because I was from there and my parents owned land and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and of course, being of Scottish ancestry, I uh, I understood myself as a kind of continuation of a Scottish uh, settlement in in Nova Scotia. I, I thought about Nova Scotia as being this kind of new Scotland, this place that um, started existing in the 1600s when people discovered it, uh, and so on and so forth. I mean, this is a this is a, a thing that I think we're thinking about a lot, all of us, uh, more and more. Um, is like, how have we been taught to think about the land that we live on? And how can we start to shift the ways that we think about the land that we live on? But for me, uh, thinking about Nova Scotia or New Scotland, uh, and then learning later on that uh, Nova Scotia, of course, has another name, which is Mi'kma'ki, 
um, made me understand that the language that we have and the names that we have to call places shape our relationships and our understandings of those places. So when I thought about Nova Scotia and myself in Nova Scotia, I thought about tartan, I thought about bagpipes, I thought about my sort of own Scottish heritage being affirmed in the land itself. Um, but when I heard Nova Scotia called Mi'kmaq and understood that that was another name for this place, I understood myself as a settler and as perhaps an uninvited guest. Um, and that my relationship to this land was much more complex than just being from here. So that idea of language shaping our understanding of place has played into my practice uh, in a huge way. And I think that was a kind of point that shifted my thinking and opened up my thinking to, uh, to a lot of different ideas around how we see and experience the environment around us. Uh, so from that, idea, I, I was invited or was sort of selected very luckily to go to Antarctica uh, with a group of artists on the Antarctic Biennial. And this, uh, this trip took us by boat to the peninsula of Antarctica with the idea that we would create a biennial of art on the Antarctic continent. It's like such a strange idea that uh, we can talk about in the in the in the after times. I mean, it, it, the after times being the the time when we're all hanging out in this room together, um, because there is definitely has a, has problematics and is like definitely a strange idea, and an interesting idea to think about what does a biennial mean if there's really not very many people there to see it. Um, but, but the idea was to go and to create art about Antarctica in Antarctica. And so I went uh, with the idea of, uh, of thinking about Antarctica as a place um, that was mostly shaped, our understanding was mostly shaped by scientific data. So the language that I had to access Antarctica was a lot of language like, uh, like the sort of scientific facts that I knew about it. Um, as well as this kind of romanticism of explorers and adventurers that had gone there. Um, and one of the main ways that I could experience the continent was through satellite imagery um, before I actually got there. So I was looking at these satellite maps and these Google images of Antarctica and thinking about how removed and how, how specific that was a language to think about this place that, that otherwise I had very little access to. So I took that satellite imagery um, and I traced it onto a series of long sheets of paper. Um, and I then decided to notate the satellite imagery itself as though it was a musical score. And this is my first uh, sort of foray into music scores. I had studied music as a, as a teen in, in school, but I wasn't somebody who played music or like I'm, I'm not somebody that necessarily can even easily read music. Um, but I was really interested in the way that if basically my, I thought my thought was if this map and this satellite imagery is a kind of language that we have to shape our experience of a place, if this, if we can think about maps or data, scientific data as, as a kind of language, then maybe that language can be played with the way that I can play with English. And so perhaps I can make use, make metaphors with that language or even make um, make analogies with that language. So I wanted to make a metaphor between, and, and, and that language could also be translated. So I wanted to make a metaphor between the idea of the coastline of Antarctica and a musical score. And I wanted to translate the, the satellite imagery into a musical score. So Language always, I'll, I'll say it again and again, but I come back to language always in my practice as a kind of uh, way of understanding what it is that I'm motivated to do. So this is the score part of it. It's uh, very long. I think it's probably about 18 or 20 feet long when it's all laid out. Um, and this is uh, this was my audience <laughs> in Antarctica. Uh, so mostly it was penguins. There were a few seals. There was a lot of whales. Um, it was a, a strange idea to present it to these creatures rather than to human creatures. Um, there was about 60, uh, 60 of us on the boat. So there was also some humans that were watching, but it was, it was a, yeah, it was a strange, a strange audience for work. And here I am presenting it, um, looking 
slightly uh, gobsmacked, I think, by the fact that I'm here <laughs> in Antarctica. And what was really amazing about this was that I uh, I was listening to the or like we were playing the music out of these speakers and like into this sound that we were in. And then because there was not, uh, I guess it's because it was an unusual experience for the animals to be hearing music. Uh, the penguins and seals actually all came up and were getting very close because they were confused about what this sound was. And I mean, that could be, you know, that's kind of a nice idea that they were listening, but of course it is also a kind of sound pollution. So it's it was an interesting idea of being um, in this space and, and realizing how much my presence was affecting it. I just have a really short clip of a video and I'll just play you just a few seconds of it so you can hear what this composition sounded like as played through a, a computer program. Um, so that idea of thinking about the coastline itself and capturing and translating something about the coastline itself of, of this uh, place into, into music got me starting thinking about the fragility of the ice there and the kind of understanding that I had that, that the ice at the poles, um, the Arctic and Antarctic ice, was integral to our, the health of our planet. And I wanted to think about that ice and the fragility of that ice and the experience of knowing that this ice was melting and that we were sort of uh, in the middle of this great climate shift and climate change that was happening. This, this quote-unquote Anthropocene, which is a term that, uh, that I am interested in and have criticisms of, of course. Um, and so I wanted to think about what the experience of witnessing the change in this ice uh, could be. And I wanted to think about witnessing it through music. So I created a program, like sort of after, after coming back from Antarctica, I created a program called Requiem for the Polar Regions. Uh, and it's an ongoing program that uh, tracks the daily shifts in sea ice at the poles. So sea ice is a little different than the land ice of Antarctica. Antarctica has ice on land that at times like giant chunks of it have been breaking off. And it also has sea ice that, that floats in every winter and freezes every winter and shores up fast around it. And the Arctic has sea ice that fills in and freezes up every winter and then every summer, it, some of it melts back. And so the sea ice at the Arctic never completely has, hasn't ever completely disappeared. Um, there's always been some frozen, uh, as well as around Antarctica, the continent itself. But every year, uh, scientists have tracked that there's less and less sea ice that's reforming each winter. So in the summers, it melts back and it will melt back to a further, like sort of recede further and further uh, closer to the pole, and then in the um, in the winter it will refreeze, but it will refreeze less of it will refreeze. So we're losing sea ice every year. And in in uh, Antarctica, strangely, scientists have found that there's been a lot of strange fluctuations with the sea ice. Where some years we're getting more, and then some years less, and it seems to have to do with shifting patterns in in uh, ocean currents. Or they're they're trying to figure this out, but uh, what you see, these two images, are taken from the National Snow and Ice Data Center in Colorado, and they actually each day release an image of what the sea ice looks like. Uh, so I was really interested in that. Again, this idea of scientific language or scientific data as a kind of language of experience, knowing, of course, that um, that the experience of of being present with the ice itself in Antarctica and knowing that uh, that the experiences of people who live in the north uh, and depend on sea ice for for their survival uh, would have been quite different than these like removed scientific analysis of of these places. So, so I I was interested in translating this data into something poetic, um, and I 
I wanted to use a sort of similar process of mapping the contours of the ice each day as music. So I wrote with the help of a, a programmer, Kenny Lazowski, um, who is at the Banff Center, we wrote a program that takes these images every day and translates them to music. And you can listen on the internet. Uh, you can go to uh, the link. Uh, Christina has the link and can share it in the chat. But there's a the website is called polarregions.net. And you can go and you can listen to the, what the CI sounds like um, any day up to and including three days back from today. So October 27th is today's sea ice. This is what the sea ice looks like uh, today. Um, the North, the Arctic sea ice being on the left of your screen and then on the, on the or sorry, on the right of your screen and then the Antarctic on the left. Um, and you can see, I put up 2010, October 27th as well. So you can see that there's been some really significant changes in just 10 years time. Um, and you can see that visually. Uh, and with the program itself, you can actually go through and listen, uh, listen and see the sea ice from any time back about 30 years. I think it starts in the 90s, they, or I guess that's 40 years now, um, 30 years. They started recording the sea ice uh, since 1990. So you can go back and see it from 1990 until today, any day. Um, but you can also listen to it. So this is what the sea ice sounded like today, this or on October 27th. You should be able to see it. So this is tracing both the Antarctic continent and the sea ice of the Arctic. And it's tracing around the contours of each bit of ice. So it's a program that basically maps uh, to a polar grid and then finds these little contours and points and assigns a, uh, a note to that point based on a scale that goes from lowest to highest. So lowest being the pole itself and highest being uh, however far the, the ice reaches out. Um, so that's the that's today's ice, and I want to just by a comparison to let you listen to the ice ten years ago, so you can hear and see if you can hear some differences. Oh, and I should say. Um, louder notes, notes that you hear louder as part of the program, are sounding thicker ice, and the softer notes are sounding thinner ice. Uh, and the way we could determine that because the scientific images that we get are microwave images, and so they give a, a heat map of how thick the ice is. So you can hear definitely in the older ice in the 10 years ago, that there is uh, more detail that's being played in the program. And I think that's the kind of interesting thing that's happening is that, um, especially in the Arctic, what's happening is a lot of the ice is being lost in some of the smaller little coves and inlets. And so the program is no longer sending and, and finding these smaller far out bits of ice. Um, and so you you lose a little bit of the detail of the of the composition as well. Um, so if you're interested in going to see more about that, you can go to the website and you can play around with it. And if any of you are um, are working in schools, it's a really fun thing to play with uh, with the, with your students to give to your students to play around with because they can actually take it and listen throughout the these thirty year span. But um, as well, if you're musicians and you're curious uh, and would like, you can download the MIDI tracks each day. So any day you can, it's accessible to you, you can just download a MIDI track that then you can use to translate into a notational score or to use as a MIDI file. And um, if you're interested in doing that, I'm happy to you could please connect with me and we can talk about that. Um, I just wanted to, oh, for the, for the 
nerds among us, I just wanted to give you an idea of what those MIDI files look like, um, because I think it's interesting you do actually start to see that they trace the contour of the ice itself. So these are the MIDI files as they look in my Ableton uh, or program. And so you can see actually that it is very much just a, a trace of that contoured shape as it goes and traces along, uh, which I find pretty wonderful to think about. Um, here's just one more piece on that uh, Polar Regions project. This is, uh, I wanted to give you like a sense of the notational scores for this as well. So this shows you at the top, um, the Arctic ice in 1990, which is the sort of ghosted image uh, in the back, and then what it looked like in 2019, um, same day, January 1st. So you can see that kind of ghostly image uh, is much is is a bit higher actually than the than the um, present day image, and that means that the ice has melted back something like two or three tones, which is also another way of of looking at this and thinking about this. The lower one is the lowest recorded ice ever in the Antarctic, which was what we were seeing in 2019. I think is that what it says. Ah, two differences between the ice in 2019. Um, so all of that thinking about language that we have to talk about in the environmental crisis and, and the climate crisis that we find ourselves in, uh, what I was really thinking about is how can we experience this uh, through art and through our kind of like our, our experiences and our sort of emotional experiences uh, when so much of the information that we get and so much of the ways that we have access to this is through scientific data and through a sort of removed analysis of what's happening. So, so I wanted to think about how can we talk about climate change uh, without talking about facts and numbers and talking about it in more um, emotional or poetic ways. Um, and of course, I think a lot of artists are doing that in really beautiful ways. And I think that is maybe one of one of the jobs of artists that I see right now is to is to show us ways to witness and to be present with what's happening um, to our environment and and to inspire us to action. I, I hope. Um, so I be kept thinking about this idea of like how can we capture and reflect what's happening now. And I found myself at a artist residency in Ontario in Scarborough, uh, the Doris McCarthy. Uh, residency at Fool's Paradise. I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with it, but if you're not, um, it is open to artists of all ilk, and it's a really fascinating residency to participate in. It's actually, it's kind of like a retreat. I lived in this cottage or this house in Scarborough for two months. This is, in fact, in Scarborough proper. It's down by the ravine, uh, by the, like, right on the bluffs, and looking out from this, uh, like, like if you turned around, you'd just be facing Lake Ontario. And it was stunning. It was a stunning place to spend two months. Doris McCarthy, uh, if you're not familiar with her work, I encourage you to check it out, was a landscape painter in Canada for, for years and years, as well as an educator. But she also really loved birds. And she traced birds and tried to, um, tried to track all of the birds that she'd seen in her life. And uh, she she notated many of her journals. She kept like, she's a very avid journal keeper and she notated many of her journals with the birds that she saw each day. So she'd be like, ah, you know, red winged blackbirds and then talking about what had happened with the day. Um, she also notated all of her bird books with dates of she'd, where she'd seen the, the birds. And so she had this kind of archive of bird activity that she'd recorded um, over her lifetime at this, at this house in Scarborough. And of course, Scarborough's ravines, uh, which you're probably familiar with, um, are really active places for wildlife. Uh, they become corridors between the lake and the uh, like, and away from the urban center of Toronto. So there's a ton of wildlife that's actually moving through this space, even though it is a relatively urban space, which is super fascinating to me. Um, when I was there, I was seeing foxes and deer quite regularly. There was deer that would come and play in this fountain in the front, which was just like, it was a bit like being in a Disney movie. You know, you come out and it's just, there's deer and foxes and probably coyotes in the background and uh, birds everywhere. 
And uh, the groundskeeper had lived with uh, Doris McCarthy in the last years of her life and also had stories about Doris's avid love of birds. So I became really enamored with the story. Obviously, I'm, I'm kind of going on about it because I was really thinking about the way that Doris had witnessed this place and had kind of provided in a small way, a record of what had happened there. And so I knew that she had seen many, many birds. And I knew from her from her journals and from her notes that I had access through through the University of Toronto. I knew that, that this had been uh, like a major point in her life, um, a major project of her life to kind of see birds and record them. And I wanted to create a, a kind of sonic portrait of the birds that were still present at Fool's Paradise uh, the summer that I was there. So I was working with spectrograms of bird songs, again, thinking back to this idea of language and scientific language and, and thinking about how we can record, um, how we can record sound and how we can kind of look at sound uh, as an object rather than as a, a kind of phenomena, I guess. <laughs> like, I was really curious to know um, what sound, how sound might exist outside of just an, uh, an audio uh, recording of it um, and how sound was being analyzed. And especially with bird song, spectrograms are used um, to, to study birds, to identify birds, and to study changes in wildlife patterns. And so I found that really, really interesting and exciting. And visually, I found spectrograms quite exciting to look at. And my background originally was in visual arts, even though now I kind of work very much between between art disciplines. Uh, mm -hmm. But I was really drawn to the graphic nature of the spectrogram. So, uh, so if you're not familiar with the spectrogram, um, basically it's a sound image that uh, works like any kind of graph, X, Y graph. So it's kind of, you can see that things that are, are um, darker are, are louder, things that are softer are light, are, quieter, things that are higher represent, I, I believe, a higher amplitude um, or a higher frequency, sorry. So you, could, you can see that things that are higher are kind of um, higher note, like higher sounding. And you can also see the, the rhythm of the, of the sound. So you can see how the sound kind of maps out over time. Um, that's like my very much a basic basic explanation that might be wrong and please take me up on that if it is because I would like to find out more about them but I've been really interested in them and and checking them out for a long time this is a bird spectrogram and I am embarrassed to say that I don't know which bird this is but um but maybe I'll just skip ahead for a second but I got um, I was quite interested in in spectrograms and I started doing a series of pieces called Silent Spring, which was looking at birds that are missing from the environment or that were going uh, going quiet, basically, were threatened or endangered. This is a bobolink. Um, and so this bird, this is the, the bobolink spectrogram cut with a laser cutter out of a piece of paper so that the image itself appears as like a ghosted, um, absent presence within the, within the, the frame of the image. So going back, uh, so at Fool's Paradise, um, I wanted to capture the experience of the birds there this, and, and create this kind of sonic portrait. And I took, uh, I took the entire two months to just listen to the birds that I could hear. And I started training myself to identify the birds by ear with the help of my mom, who uh, is an avid birder, as well as the groundskeeper uh, and other other people and the internet. Um, and I was listening and trying to identify, okay, I can hear the patterns of how these birds sing together. Uh, and you're probably aware uh, that birds sing mostly at dawn and dusk. They sing in the morning. It's called the dawn chorus. And then they come in, I realized, uh, in a particular order and a kind of in a particular way each morning. So the robins start singing at a particular time, the swallows, the thrushes will come in. And then at a certain point, when the sun gets high enough, the hawks start swooping through and everything will silence for a second. And then everybody comes back singing again. And it became this really... Um, this chorus that I became quite familiar with, like the rhythms and the sort of spacing of it. 
And at a certain point, it would sort of soften out into the the higher sunlight day and, and like sort of as dawn faded into daylight. Um, and then the birds became relatively quiet and then they became more active again at night. So actually the image on your, uh, on your right, I'm so bad at left and right. The one that's more dense, basically, the, the denser image, uh, that is the graphic score for the Dawn Chorus at Fool's Paradise as of 2018 when I was there. And you can see that actually it's composed of uh, many, many overlaid spectrograms. And so I wanted to take the spectrograms themselves and use them to represent the presence of the birds. And I took those spectrograms and each one I then translated uh, into a musical notation by mapping it on as on a musical staff. Uh, and so this is a uh, Don Chorus. And then I wanted to capture this experience of the birds, how they, how they kind of came back into action in the evening and how they faded out into the evening. And so the, the companion score for this is Evensong, um, which I named after the Anglican sung mass uh, in the evening. So here are these two pieces that I, I left with, and these were my, my portrait of Fool's Paradise and my sort of honoring of Doris as well, in a way. Uh, and I then took that composition and I extended it into a, um, an eight channel audio piece that was installed at the Toronto Sculpture Garden. Uh, I did that <laughs> with the help of my, my partner and my often collaborator, Pamela Hart, um, who is a, a musician and an audio engineer. So definitely this was uh, stretching my own technical limits and I was really grateful to have the support um, to bring Pamela into the, pro the project. And I will just say, you know, artists uh, were so limited, in some ways we're limited by by what we're, we get the support to do, you know, and this was a project, the first time that I got, um, a really healthy budget to to create something. And it was really incredible to get to really explore what that meant. And I was really grateful to the city of Toronto for that, as well as the Toronto Biennial who's, who supported it. Um, so you can hear uh, just a quick, I'll give you just a quick tour of the, of the audio of this, but basically each channel, each speaker is playing a different, uh, a different channel of sound and the channels are all playing independently of each other, but they're all synchronized. Um, and the idea is that you can walk among these, these, uh, I guess this kind of like forest almost and listen and kind of have this experience of moving through birdsong. But what I was trying to think about as well is how we're losing this birdsong in our environment and how uh, perhaps ways that we might be able to remember it and ways that we might um, try to try to re replay it in our environment as as our bird song is going more and more quiet and as we're losing more and more of our songbird population. So you can hear just a little. In the morning, it starts out by, oh, maybe. In the morning, it starts out analog. It's played by Tanya Iyer, who's a musician in Toronto, in, uh, Montreal. Uh, and you can hear, uh, so basically like it's been looped and processed by Pamela and I, and, uh, and, and so Tanya is playing the original scores um, that I, that I gave to her. And, uh, and in the morning it starts out very analog. Uh, so it's, it's that piano music that she was originally playing. And then as we move into uh, sort of midday, the sound shifts. And it shifts into a much more synthesized and synthetic sound. Um, and what I wanted to do is create a kind of full day where the sound starts out as this kind of analog piano music moves through a very crunchy and digitized and uncomfortable um, middle and then moves into in the evening a much more synthetic and synthesized uh, but sonically pleasing and sort of like easy to listen to sound. So 
Uh, you're welcome to explore that more. There's there's more documentation of that on my website if you want to listen more to it. Um, but uh, I uh, <laughs> sorry, I lost my train of thought for a second. Oh, um, what I wanted to show you as well was a video of it in action because that's just like an actual recording of it. But the entire track was twenty, or I mean, it was a twenty four hour loop, and the entire track was. Uh, 18 hours long, I think. So it ran from 5 a.m. till uh, 8 p.m. at night. And then it would spend a few hours in silence and then it would kind of come back on in the morning. So this is like a, a, a very low quality video um, and just trying to give you an idea of what it feels like in the space. very quick. Um, it's always hard to get documentation of your work. But uh, that that piece um, really interestingly also, uh, because there were so many birds that were in this tiny little park in downtown Toronto, it was populated also by birds and there was a running fountain. So it felt like a very, very much a collaboration, a sound collaboration between the natural environment of the park and this, this sort of sound work as well as a collaboration with the sounds of the city. So, you know, at certain points, the trams would go by or the, um, the chapel, the cathedral that was just across the street would ring its bells. And so it was also just about the sort of sonic experience of the city itself, um, which is kind of amazing. And at times it felt like you could barely hear it. And at times it felt very loud. Um, so it's a really interesting experience, like working with a sound sculpture in that place. And I'm grateful that I got to do it. Uh, so continuing on to think about this idea of spectrograms and using spectrograms as graphic scores, uh, it took me, I'll just, uh, it took me on a, on a bunch of different projects and I've used these now with choirs, um, with, uh, ensembles of musicians with, and, and more and more in my teaching work. Um, I've been using it with uh, with people who don't play music, but using graphic scores as a way to invite sound making and thinking about how we might make sounds um, and how we might sort of record and record an experience and reactivate that experience. So this is a score uh, called Silent Spring, Montreal to Jage. Um, and so this was for, I was in Montreal at McGill as an artist in residence there. And I wanted to create a score of bird songs that of birds that were uh, threatened in the Montreal area. So this is 10 birds that because of the urbanization of the city, their sounds or their songs, their presence, and then also their sounds were being lost. Um, and so I wanted to create this, this score as a kind of uh, acknowledgement of spring. So a, a way of saying uh, spring is arriving and these are sounds that we are missing and let's play them the best we can with, with instruments or like through this process and perhaps we'll call them, call them back. Uh, perhaps these instruments can call them back. Um, or even just create an experience of, of uh, presence with, uh, with the idea that these sounds are otherwise not being heard. So I worked with three musicians uh, or four, I think, three really amazing musicians um, who were part of the doctoral program, uh, jazz program at McGill. And I could just play you a, a very short little, uh, uh, their, their uh, playing of this score, I'll, I'll play for you. Um, so that was, an, I, I think, in the end, that ended up being about a 20-minute performance. Um, and one of the things that I found really exciting to talk about and to think about, uh, and something that I, I had thought about a lot with, a, with much of my work, is that uh, when you have this kind of music that is uh, created out of 
out of these translations or out of this this data, um, of course, some of it ends up being composed and sounding sonically, like it's been sort of like sonically put together. Uh, but there's also a sort of sense of discord that happens in the sound. And I'm really interested in that, that sort of uncomfortable feeling or those moments when the sound starts to feel like it doesn't make sense to our ears. Uh, because I think that's a way of indicating that, um, that we're in crisis and that we need to attend to to this moment of discord or this moment of crisis. And so it's a way of thinking about, you know, if this feels uncomfortable or if it feels unfamiliar, um, it also reflects the, un the, the unfamiliarness and weirdness of what's happening in our environment. Um, not to say that that environmental, like, like that sounds always have to sound pretty or they have to sound composed, but that um, I think I invite that idea of discord into the work as a way of thinking about discomfort or as uh, or unfamiliarity and and sitting with that unfamiliarness as a way of of trying to attend to the weirdness of our of our current environmental situation. Um, here's just I, I won't play you this. This is another example of this kind of work uh, that I did in New York. Um, when I was there last summer or last, sorry, last fall, time is, time is nothing anymore to any of us. <laughs> um, so uh, this is called Nine Songs for New York and it's nine birds that were likewise threatened in the New York region. Um, and I wanted to play with these spectrograms uh, as well as to reflect some of the hard edged and geometric experience of the city itself. So I was thinking about the textures that I was encountering within the city, um, as well as the textures of these spectrograms. And so I was playing with the movement and the textures that I was kind of encountering every day as I was moving through the urban space. And these, here's a, a close up. These were played um, by a group of musicians there in New York uh, as a way of like sort of similarly, but of course, because they were different musicians uh, and different instruments and not jazz, but also more classically trained, it was an entirely different <laughs> sonic experience. So it was quite fun to, to get to hear that in two different ways. Um, so continuing to think about uh, how sound is missing and how birdsong is missing in our environments and using birdsong as a kind of uh, analogy for many of the things that we are seeing going missing in our environment. Uh, I wanted to, I was working at Struts and Fawcett in Sackville, New Brunswick. It's a fantastic organization uh, and they have really great artist residencies. Highly recommend checking them out, what they're doing there. Um, but I wanted to create a series of banners for the city itself. Uh, so these are vinyl banners that go on the on the light poles and they they replace um, or they kind of introduce this concrete poetry uh, of bird song into the environments. Um, so basically uh, there's three birds that have gone extinct in, in the uh, Atlantic region that went extinct before uh, audio recording equipment existed to capture their sound. So the passenger pigeon, which uh, flourished throughout the North American continent, um, the Labrador duck, and the great auk, um, which is three, the, are these three birds that were extinct before, yeah, before their sound could be recorded. And with the, in the case of the passenger pigeon, there was a lot of work done by one particular uh, scientist, and I can't actually remember his name, but was, I read quite a bit about him and he became quite uh, diligent about trying to translate by hand uh, the passenger pigeon music into musical notations. And there's been a few people who have done this um, with different birds, but he was really driven by this idea that that this music would be lost and that he wanted to communicate what this music was. And I thought about his sort of, um, yeah, his his drive to do this and I was really inspired by it as well as kind of poetically affected by the futility of it uh, that you know you want to kind of record this but you can't um, and so I took I uh, there was a bunch of people had had sort of written down in their like trying to translate into English sounds um, what what these birds sounded like so this is the great auk 
Um, and I love so much that people could say, well, it sounded like a low croaking, a hoarse call or a gurgling sound. Um, and there were the, the Labrador duck was a low whistle and uh, the passenger pigeon was all kinds of strange, like kiwits and tiwoos and things like this that, that the passenger pigeons would make. So this project uh, I called Song, Song for the Great Auk, the Labrador Duck and the Passenger Pigeon. And it's, um, it's still, I, I actually don't know if it's still up in Sackville. I've got to ask some friends. I haven't been able to get there, but I will be able to go now. So, so, uh, so this is another way of thinking about how we might recall sound in our environment or how we might recall that, that things are absent in our environment that, that would have been there in the past. Um, so thinking this is second to last, what I'll talk about before we open it up and I can see that the chat is lighting up a bit, but I can't actually see it. So if, uh, if I'm missing questions, I apologize. And I really hope we get to keep talking. Um, but uh, yeah, this is a project that is very much about our environmental crisis. Um, it's much about the present. This is called Murmurations. And it's a score for social distancing. So I began uh, with the, the, one of the things that I was really thinking about at the outset of the pandemic was the ways in which we needed to, um, we needed to start understanding ourselves as a collective species rather than as individuals. Uh, and thinking about how this culture of individuality had been, uh, and this culture of sort of like individual exceptionalism was uh, was no longer a matrix for thinking about how we might survive as a species. Um, and so, you know, you kind of have this idea of like the myth of like, like one hero will save us from the environmental crisis. But of course, really where we need to think about ourselves as an interdependent species and as a species that also is interdependent with the ecology of our environments um, and our ecosystems like as ways of thinking through how we will survive. So uh, so the, the virus hit and it became, this was things I was already thinking about. And then the virus hit and it became so clearly illustrated to me that this was, you know, and I think for many of us have now started really, really attending to this idea that we need to think about collective health in all kinds of different ways. And we've seen shifts in, shifts in government policy towards that. And we've seen, what happens when people don't have those structures in place. Um, so, so this score is a score uh, that is a dance for seven people. And the, the dance holds you in two meters distance or more with, seven, with your seven other dancers. So no one ever gets within two meters of each other or you come within two meters and then you kind of rotate around each other and keep moving. And this, the idea for the patterning of the score and the, and the name itself is taken from bird flocks and flocking behavior and uh, looking at how bird flocks uh, operate. So basically a bird in a flock of birds is aware of seven birds in its periphery. And from there it can, uh, it can judge its motion, its speed and its rotation based on the movements of those seven birds. So that's when you see these like shimmering and undulating uh, murmurations of birds that happen, um, especially this time of year as the flocks are starting to migrate again, or in the spring, um, and you see these clouds, uh, that's what's happening for each individual bird is this kind of like seven, seven people awareness. And so I was thinking, well, in truth, like when I'm entering public space now and attempting to social distance with people, especially in a dense urban area, uh, you have to hold this kind of awareness of seven people around you um, and sort of move in relation to the people around you. And so I was amazed to see, you know, as we're moving through the park, at first it felt, you know, like I, I was living near a, near a park that was frequently used. And so at first when we were walking through it, it felt quite unnatural to be uh, shifting around each other. And there was like a lot of kind of like shy embarrassment about it. Um, but at a certain point it just kind of clicked and, for those of you that live in dense urban spaces, you probably have this, uh, this feeling. At a certain point, it clicks and you start to actually just navigate and dance together with this two meter distance in mind. And then of course, some rogue person runs through and you're just like, you're in my bubble. But 
<laughs> that that happens as well. So this is a this is the dance score for this piece. But I was interested rather than creating the dance itself in just having this score be a presence uh, in public space. So this is the score installed in uh, Lansdowne Center in Richmond um, on a beautiful sunny day. It's painted right on the pavement. Um, and the idea was like up as a public art piece and the idea is that people could come and follow the, the notational markings uh, of the dance score and they would do, um, yeah, they could perform the dance. And so it's kind of like this wacky hopscotch that people could do. And here it is, all of us performing it um, and moving through it. And you'll note that the directional markings are kind of uh, based on our social distance markings that are showing up in grocery stores and all over the place. Although we're so used to them now, we probably aren't, or they're all getting worn off the pavement. Um, so this piece, I hope to continue installing in different ways and different places, because I think it's a really beautiful way to think about acts of collective care um, and these kinds of moments. Like, I love this idea of, of bodies moving in relation to each other in public space and sort of like as the and that that might be a way of thinking about collective care. So uh, so that piece um, moves me away from the kind of musical uh, music of the of my practice and the sort of late ways that I'm working with music, but still falls very much into this idea of, of translation and, and, and gesture um, and actually connects quite a bit to a lot of work that I've done around uh, movement as well as dance that I just haven't touched on as much in this in this talk. Um, the last piece that I want to talk about is a piece that I just finished um, and in the Richmond area um, but is a piece that I think likewise is quite translatable to many different places. I came across this map of wild, threatened, endangered, and lost streams of the lower Fraser Valley, which is kind of what Richmond, greater Vancouver area is. Um, and I was living in this part, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but uh, the dense red at the bottom, kind of bottom of the screen uh, is Richmond. And Richmond is an agricultural area and it was a kind of flat plain delta that goes down to the Fraser River. And so there was a lot of streams that were diverted, buried, um, lost, dried up uh, for because of uh, environmental or sort of because of the urbanization of the area as well as the agriculture of the area. So I took the this these uh, streams that had been lost and everything that you see that is in red uh, are streams that would have existed in Richmond at a certain point. Uh, and the blue dot is where I was living, just in case you're curious, because um, this is a Google map. So. I was looking at how all of these streams fled, sort of th yeah, thread through the uh, the city, and Richmond is like a really it's it's a suburb city, um, so it's very densely residential, and so all of these squares that you see are actually filled with houses, and then in between each of the houses in the neighborhoods and the and the different um, developments, there's these little paths that wind through still and that are publicly accessible. And so there's ways that you can move through Richmond that are kind of entirely on these sort of hidden secret little paths, which I find quite exciting and lovely. Um, so I created this piece called Rites of Passage. Um, and what it did is it took some of those river riverways that had been lost and reimagined them as walking trails through the city. Uh, and I wanted to think about the way that a body moving um, through the city now might be an echo of a, uh, a body of water that had moved through, the, through that space, uh, you know, however many years ago. And so I was thinking about the movement of that sort of like re-performance of movement. So in a way, I've talked about scores uh, as these sort of holdings of musical experience, but, but in most of my practice, I'm thinking about scores as ways of notating experience or holding experience and of activating experience again. So, so this is a way of thinking there was movement here in a certain way at one time, and now bodies moving through this will 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 
remember that movement. Um, I called it rites of passage, interestingly, because when I was researching this project, I realized that uh, there's this thing in Canada called riparian rights, um, which are that you have the right to move along uh, the bank of a body of water, um, even if that technically would be on private land, unless in the, the unless you have to you're not allowed to walk over public or private land to get to the body of water but you're allowed to move along the the sort of edge of water um and so i was thinking about this idea of riparian rights it's called your riparian right of motion i can't remember exactly what it is called but i was thinking about this idea of riparian rights and through um a densely residential space and a space that uh that had been settled and thinking about how we might reimagine these riverways and these riparian rights through the city's current geography. So I was looking at all of these little like uh, pathways and all these little secret sort of passageways through the city and tracing these, this uh, walking path through these little, these little spaces that um, were still publicly accessible while echoing the passage of the river. So you can see just here, this one, there's four of these and uh, they, they, they do their best. The bright blue is the original river passageway and then the darker blue is the new path. So they do their best to follow this, this passageway. But, um, oh no, sorry, I, it's, it's actually the opposite. The blue, the darker blue is the original river and the, and the brighter blue is the pathway now. So it's the new, the new river pathway. So, uh, so this was a project that I leave to Richmond and that I think about wanting to do in many other places, especially here where I am now, thinking about the waterways that, uh, that have been um, shifted or, or have been lost and how we might remember them. And to go along with this, I wanted to create a, an audio piece that you could listen to as you're walking. And it's a piece that uses current city sounds, um, sounds that I recorded around Richmond uh, and reimagines them as the sounds of a river. So I can play, it's about 28 minutes. I'll just play you a few little pieces of it. Um, but the idea was that you that you can wear it in your headphones as you're walking and, uh, and sort of reflect on this loss that this loss of sound and this sort of like reimagining of river sound through urban sounds. Sorry. one part. So you're actually hearing um, most of this you can hear there's still a lot of uh, crickets and uh, and like insect life in uh, Richmond as well as some migratory shorebirds that you can pick up. Um, the sort of whooshing sound is the sound of cars passing um, and especially passing on wet roads. So you get that kind of like wet sound, whooshing sound at certain points. And then uh, there's the sound of the foghorn and the sound of the river industry that happens, um, which that I then translated into uh, these tones that you heard in the, at the beginning. So it, there's the foghorn in the background. And so that becomes this kind of retranslated tones that echo throughout it. Um, so I leave you, I leave the, the sort of organized part of the talk um, with 
I came across this word uh, recently from a podcast called Invisibilia. If you're not familiar with it, really uh, check it out. It's a great podcast. They talk about all sorts of things um, sound related. And they this is a podcast that they talked about called The Last Sound. And it was about um it was it was about work that was kind of similar to mine. It was really beautiful to listen to a um, musician and audio recorder who had gone out and made a lifetime of recording environmental soundscapes and thinking about how that sound has shifted over years and years and years. Um, and so as part of the podcast, they talked about this word sodage, which is a Portuguese word which means um, nostalgic longing for something or someone that has been lost. Um, and I'm always interested in words that don't translate into English well. I have a whole project that I'm turning into a podcast that's about untranslatable words. It's called What We Can't Say in English. Um, but sodage struck me as this word uh, that really fits so beautifully with what we are currently experiencing in our environment. Um, or what I, what I find that I'm experiencing. And uh, basically the podcast pointed out that it's possible to experience the Daje as an anticipatory emotion. So something that you can like feel longing and missing of something and nostalgia for something before it's actually even been lost. And I think um, when we think about our thinking about, especially the our sort of sonic environment, our natural environment, a lot of us are looking around and saying, this is, this is threatened and we are already sort of missing what we still have in front of us. And so I guess it's like a, a thought um, with what I'm trying to do with some of my work is, is to witness what is present and to also think about what is being lost and what sort of in the process of being lost uh, and to attend to that, to just sit with that and to be present with it. Because I think um well, because I think that that is what I can offer. So, so that is um, that is what I have prepared, and I will stop sharing my screen, and then we can chat more back and forth. Thank you so much, uh, Lou, for a very interesting talk. We went a little bit over time, but I was I was lost to interrupt you because I was uh, really thinking with what you we were saying. So uh, we're a little bit over time, and those who have to go will say goodbye. But uh, perhaps I can read you some of the questions from the audience, and then we'll go to the upper room. So in order of submission, um, one of the attendees asked, it was uh, right after you talking about the dissonance of mm -hmm. music and your work and how it it has such an emotional quality. So the uh, question is, in the same line of thinking as accepting discordant sound as a reflective element, have you had other experiences of discovered sounds uncovering unique or unexpected emotions mm. that reflect a natural reality? Yeah, I mean, I think this is why I'm so attracted to birdsong. I think that when I started to slow down and to really listen to birdsong, um, I, I mean, I, I, it's it's so incredibly complex and it's so incredibly amazing to think about as a musician that you're listening to it. You know, thrushes can actually sing more than more than one note, like multiple notes at a time. And I think uh, I think that is part of this idea of. Uh, of what part of what I'm thinking about is um, the complexity of some of that sound and then the kind of trying to think about it musically or trying to recreate it or trying to kind of um, reimagine it and recognizing that in fact um, there's not really a there's not really a way to do that because the complexity and um, and amazement of that sound itself is um, is so unique and so I'm always interested in kind of this idea of like what happens when you fail to do something, but, but the kind of act of doing it and, and then sitting with the kind of loss within that failure of being like, of course, I cannot replay a bird sound to make it sound just like it was, but that I can, I can speak to the complexity of it and the experience of it through the, the loss of, 
or the, be, through through my inability to play it, you know. And so I sort of think about that quite a bit. Um, if that is like a way of answering that question, maybe. Okay, thank you. So another question, and um, this one comes from Sydney Lancaster. Hi, Sydney. Uh, I am thinking about the metaphorical relationships of starlings' murmurations and human behavior in a sideways way. The idea of starlings as a rat of the air and how humans can be seen as bad parasites. Was that a consideration you work? Yeah, it's interesting. Like I've read in some of that, you know, and it's hard not to think about, um, well, yeah, like I think it's hard not to think about how, um, hard not to think about that. Hard not to think about how humans are, are affecting the environment so negatively. And I, I think that um, I often try to remove some of the ideas of like good and bad from what I'm doing. And I try to remove some of the kind of uh, the attachments of like, you know, I think like humans are doing incredible destruction to our environment. But but what I'm thinking about more is a witnessing or kind of like removal from that and just saying, can I look at what's actually happening? And I think, um, you know, starlings, starlings are the wrath of the wrath of the environment for sure, as are cormorants or as are uh, the right now the coyote population is like the wrath of my environment because, you know, the deer population, they'll eat my um, they'll eat my garden. Uh, but I think um, these are these are all things that have just come out of balance. And so when we have like a balanced ecosystem, you know, it's like more about looking at what's what's balanced and rather than looking at like analogies between like what's good and bad, I think. And so like, so when something becomes unbalanced, then it becomes a nuisance or it becomes a problem and including humans, you know, like we are out of balance with our environment. So, so yeah. Okay, thank you. So, we have a question from Sheila McMath, the artistic Hi, director of Arts Matrix, you know. So here's what she says. I was once a facilitator of an artist collaboration in which we identified climate change as a subject to address. As a facilitator, I asked the artist to then experience of climate change, a time in which the artists were keenly aware, viscerally, aware of the climate change, a time in which climate change hit them in a non-intellectual way. It was a successful creative exercise and I recommend it for igniting potentially authentic artistic response to climate change. Your work is somehow related to this experience that I have. And she adds, oops, I guess that's not a question. But do you have a response to this? Yeah, I mean, I think this is really um, something that I'm trying to figure out how to do for myself, and and how to do, and how in a way that I'm like experiences that I'm trying to give to people. This is, um, yeah, is being present rather than being analytical about climate change, but actually just being present and sitting with it and thinking about um, what it feels like. Um, you know, it's interesting, like I was saying recently, so I've moved to Nova Scotia. There's a lot of ticks in Nova Scotia right now. The tick population is out of control. It's pretty, pretty difficult because of course, you know, and there's been an explosion of tick population all over the Eastern seaboard. And, um, and I've been saying, you know, this is a result of climate change. Like this is something that's happened in the last few years and it's a warmer seasons that we're having these like explosions of population and there's lower, there's lower predators for them. And, less birds that are picking them off and so on and so forth. So, um, so I've been talking about that and, and, you know, it's a very different experience to have something that really impacts your daily life and the, your daily quality of life, because the intensity of the ticks here can impact your daily quality of life. Uh, than it is to be like, ah, oh, the ocean is warming, but like, what does that really mean? Or like, oh, we got a bad storm, but you know, we've always had bad storms, but you know, to have something where you're actually like, this is, you know, when you see the fires in California this year and it was like, th there's no way to not see this for the horror that it is. And I think, I think we're getting to a point where we, where we, this is no longer a projected future. This is a present reality. And so how can we, how can we sit with it? And I think like that idea of facilitation, you know, 
you know, like facilitating a project about that, but, you know, like, like maybe that artists are also facilitators of that um, experience, like that we can like help people to kind of be present in it. Um, and ho like hopefully offer some hope within it too, or some, yeah, because it is, it can be very heavy things. One last question also from Sydney Lancaster. Now that you are back in Nova Scotia, will the notion of Sodad figure in your explorations of coming home? Oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, for sure, for sure. Uh, yeah, I think, um, I think that, you know, all of this is tied together, like this experience of, um, an experience of land and a kind of like memory of what something was when I was a kid, uh, an experience of like being an adult in this land, um, an experience of understanding the like the the terrible legacy of of colonial violence that's happened here. All of that means that you are like I think that to like kind of be present in that, I feel I'm like I'm kind of caught in a sort of um, in a kind of like complexity of emotion about it. So I think that so, like I came across the Daje recently and I was like, you know, this really does speak to this way that I am thinking about um, experience right now. And I had a conversation with my friend, Amy Claire uh, Hustis, who if you're not familiar with her work, she's doing a lot of work. Basically she's made a life's work out of uh, walking through a marsh in Richmond area every, every night. And, um, and so she and I were talking, chatting and walking in this march together and just talking about, you know, what does it mean just to kind of, uh, just to try to sort out this kind of complexity of emotion. And, and I think, yeah, I think it, it's really uh, present for me, especially now being home. 